السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وبعد now we're in our final session with our discussions of some of the elementary stages of the discussions of ilm and knowledge and uh, the journey of seeking that sacred knowledge as accordance to al-imam al-nawawi's guide to benefiting from al-ilm which is the introductory chapter of al-majmu' of al-imam al-nawawi and we spoke about the first category of knowledge which every one of us must know which is our acquaintance with Allah and what its limitations are and Al-Imam al we separates our acquaintance with Allah from delving into the things that are spoken of by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that are beyond our understanding and our imagination. He also spoke about the realities of wudu, the realities of salah, the realities of zakah, the realities of the hajj, the things that are pertinent to our day-to-day -day objectives and obligations in life. Must, we must have intricate knowledge of them as they arise. He then continues and says, As for the laws that relate to buying and selling and marriage and divorce. So the Imams have said, he says, it is something that is stopped in accordance to the one who seeks further knowledge in it. So if someone's going to get married and they want to know what, what my contract, what can I stipulate in it, what I can't, therefore it becomes on a need to know basis. It's something therefore that becomes obligatory upon them. Uh, a husband who intends on divorce, for example, cannot just do it haphazardly. They have to have some insight and some clarity onto what are the things and objectives of divorce, what the grounds for it are, and so forth, uh, and so on. Same with the sister who's seeking khullah, and so forth. It's not a knee-jerk reaction, rather it's something that is knowledge-based, and based on an understanding of what is the word of Allah, what is the sunnah of his messenger, وسلم, and how it was understood by the great imams. He also continues by says, وَيَلْزَمَهُ It is a must for each of us. This is from the categories that we must know. مَعْرِفَةْ مَا يُحِلُّ To know what is deemed halal and be able to distinguish it from that which is clearly haram. Because the Prophet ﷺ says in the famous hadith, which we all know, which is also the fifth hadith in the Imam al-Nawawi's 40 hadith collection, الْحَلَالُ بَيِّنْ وَالْحَرَامُ Bayin, halal is known, haram is known. Between them are the doubtful things. But those two, halal and haram, must be easily identifiable by the one who knows. Min al ma'kuli wal mashrubi wal malbus. He limits it, in fact, in particular to three things what we eat, what we drink, and what we wear. So a sister must know the rules of hijab, a brother must know the difference between halal and haram when it comes to food and slaughter and what is permitted and what isn't. It's not just something that can be dhan. Remember we spoke about those four things? Knowledge, ignorance, and in between them is dhan, I think. It's not enough to say, oh, I think. Once you have a question about something halal or haram that relates to those three things, food, drink, and clothes, it's not enough to say, oh, I think it's halal. You now must become prepared and ready to delve and search for an answer from a mufti or someone more knowledgeable in you that relates that knowledge to you in a coherent and clear manner. And that's the madhab, that is the opinion. And how to live with your wife. Now that's, uh, I don't know where you're going to go for that, but you're going to have to ask someone, somewhere, somehow, right? How to accommodate and live well with your spouse. In particular, he limits it to a man knowing how to live with his wife. Now these are, when we read these words, sometimes we miss out their value. It's not obligatory for a woman to know how to live with her husband, in the sense that it become, it's much easier for a, a, a sister to develop uh, that level of trust and accommodation with, with the man in her life. But Muslim men, are in a, po a point of responsibility. It's not just enough to say, oh, we coexist together, or we, have, we live together, or she's my wife. You must know intricate, intricately 
what her rights are, what her duties, what are the duties you must afford her, while she does not have to know the same for you in that detail. Is that, does that make sense? You are responsible for what are the limits that need to be set. And therefore the Prophet ﷺ, when he speaks to the people in the day Hajj, he says, Istawusu bin nisa'i khayra. Treat your women well. He doesn't say to the women, treat your men well, right? <laughs> the sisters are ready. <laughs> They're ready for it, brother. Be careful now. <laughs> In another hadith that is poorly understood, the Prophet ﷺ says, <laughs> The woman was created from the rib. Eve was created from Adam. Hawa from Adam salam. <laughs> if you try to straighten that rib, it will break. People misunderstand this hadith. Al Imam al Nawawi clarifies this hadith. He says that because her rib is bent, it doesn't mean she's crooked, which is a mistranslation. You read the English books, what does it say? The woman is made from a rib and the rib is crooked, which means like she's crooked, like she's not straight. No, what it means is she's created with delicacy, that if you try to hammer her, if you keep repeating things, if you keep badgering her, abusing her, so you're going to break her. You're the one who's at fault, not her for being created that way. Does that, make, does that, make, does that clarify a little bit? Yeah. It's, not, it, it's, it's the Prophet telling... <laughs> sisters know exactly what it means. <laughs> it's the Prophet وسلم, saying to the Muslim man, don't be overbearing. Not, he's not saying the woman was created crooked. He's telling you, don't be harsh, don't be abusive, don't be forceful, because it's not going to work. It's impossible that it will work. It's impossible that a man, by shouting, will change his wife's mind. It's impossible with violence that a man will find love with his spouse. Impossible. You cannot have it. So the Prophet is saving you the hardship. He's telling you, Listen, your wife is not like, you can't iron her out like a piece of metal. It doesn't work. She's someone who needs to be dealt with and spoken to and catered for in a different way than you would with another man. See, if my brother Ravin and I, we, we have a problem, we just have some words together. What's wrong with you? Oh, what's wrong with you? Hello? Okay, we yell at each other, we're happy. Okay, let's go play some basketball or something. Right, let's go do the khalas, it's over. But with a sister, it's not the same, especially with your wife, it's different. Why did he talk to me that way? He hurt my feelings, <laughs> right? It's now, and you find at times with the sister, it's no longer about what happened, but how she felt. One of the things uh, we talk about in Tafsir Surah Taha, we do a section called The Art of Manliness. It's actually my next course. Uh, next time I see you probably, maybe next year, the course will be called The Art of Manliness. How, what every sister needs to know and what every brother needs to know. Right? And a part of it, we talk about the character of Musa alayhi salam as a man, right? How, we, how Musa was a leader. They're lost in the desert, what he does, you know, all these kind of things. And one of the things that's key is that for many brothers, we assume that because a conversation went and nothing happened, that it's forgotten. Sister Khalas, oh, we had the argument, it was two weeks ago. No, the argument was two weeks ago, but the emotions are still very much present. She's still thinking about it. She's laying there next to you and she's like, yeah, I remember what you said. Five months later, you do something little. You didn't park the car right, or you forgot to pick something from the store. You never care about me. Remember what you said? From this year, last year, year before, what you and my, my, my mom, and on our wedding day, and oh, the whole story comes out, right? So the Prophet ﷺ, he orders the men to know how to live with their women, but doesn't order the woman to learn how to live with the man. You're responsible. So Al-Imam al-Nawawi confirms this. He says, part of the fiqh, you must know to be a man, a husband, before you get married, you need to have the talk. Someone needs to sit you down and tell you this is 
what is important in your life, these are the things that are necessary. How to live with your women. If he has a wife or if he is about to get married. And the, and the rights that are endowed in that regard. قال الشافعي, الإمام الشافعي, والأصحاب, meaning the people who are of our madhab, رحمهم الله جميعا, على الآباء, what are parents responsible for? Now this is under religious obligation of knowledge. This isn't secondary knowledge. What does a father, what does a mother, what are they required to teach? على الآباء, والأمهات, mother, fathers and mothers, to teach their young children, meaning prepubescence. It is not enough to wait until that you feel, oh, they're going to understand things better. No. It becomes obligatory in stages from their young age to begin to teach them. What will come to them once they are at a level of maturity? So your child needs to know what is tahara before they are obligated for to perform tahara. They need to know the rituals and the rites that we perform before they arrive it. This is ilm fard. It is an obligation. Is it an obligation upon the child or the parent? The parent, right? So now you're not just responsible for your education, but you're responsible legally, spiritually, ritually, religiously for your children's education. So when a father or mother does not fulfill the religious training of their child well in the madhab, and according to Imam al-Shafi'i and all of those who follow in the path, they understand that you have committed a sin. It is ma'asiyah. That is of a higher religious order that you have neglected an obligation Fardu'ain, a personal obligation, as personal as the other obligations that you fulfill in worship of Allah. You have neglected an essential duty in your relationship with Allah. So what are we responsible to teach? فَيُعَلِّمُهُ الْوَالِي Now al Imam and now we changes the word from al-ab wal-um to the word al-wali, the governor. Because I, with my children, am like the king to his country. Look at the precision of his words. Look at the fiqh. He's no longer now talking about father and mother. He's saying, no, the father and mother now take the role of a governor in the life of their children. You are a wali. So when the Prophet ﷺ says, كُلُّكُمْ رَاعٍ All of you is responsible. He's not just talking about the king or the sultan or whoever. He's talking about a father in his home, a mother with her children, a teacher in his classroom, an imam in his masjid. He's talking about those who are given responsibility. From that duty, al-ab wal-um, they become wali. They are the ones responsible for their children. يُعَلِّمُهُ tahara, وَالصَّلَاةِ وَالصَّوْمِ وَنَحْوِهَا To teach them at-tahara, Salah, Siyam, and all those obligations. وَيُعَرِّفَهُ And to teach them, even before they are at an age of obligation, تَحْرِيمُ الزِّنَا وَالْلُوَاطِ وَالسَّرِقَةِ To teach them equally the sinfulness and the prohibition of premarital activity, of adultery, of homosexuality, of a sariqa, of theft, and usurping others' property. وَشُرْبِ الْمُسْكِرِ and anything that intoxicates, wal kadib, wal ghiba, and lying and cheating and backbiting others. All of these become obligations. So if you have not sat with your 10, 12, 13 year old son or daughter, I'm not saying you sit with them and you say, okay, here's what you need to know, but taught them the way I just showed you. Remember the wudu? The essence of its meaning. It's a a comprehensive system of life. It's not, it's just rules and obligations. This is halal, this is haram. It's showing them in your conduct, approving what is in their conduct, protecting them from that which is sinful. All of the imams in our era, they tell you that a father who does not protect his children from viewing on television 
that which alludes to the haram has fallen ill into this. So when you rent a movie and you're watching something sinful, you're watching TV or you permit for them something sinful that does not show them that this kind of relationship, this kind of habit, this kind of behavior is not our culture, is not our faith, is not acceptable in our religious community, our broader community, then you have fulfilled that sinful behavior between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wabillah, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us protection from this. Allahumma ameen. Also, wa yu'arrifahu to instruct their children that reaching pubescence and reaching that puberty where a person becomes obligated taklif, that that begins upon them a new mode of life one of the things that we sometimes forget is that we forget to prepare our children for that boundary that we forget to teach them that as soon as these lines are crossed you're no longer just, you know, little Ahmad or little Umar. You're now a man before Allah. You're now a woman before Allah. Your word has to count. Your actions have uh, uh, reasons and, and statements behind them must be verified and fulfilled in accordance to your vows and your statements that is taught to you by Allah and taught to us by Allah through His Messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So you must explain when that boundary comes that life has changed in now that there is an obligation that is set upon you and train them for it. He continues to say, وَكَمَا يَجِبْ عَلَيْهِ النظر فِي مَالِهِ It is also obligatory to look into one's wealth and to see how one spends it on one's family and children and how one fulfills their needs in that which is best upon them. For it is something that can earn them a reward between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the best of wealth that can be spent on their, on, on their children, huwa ta'alimu al-Qur'an, and to, and to send them liyatafaqahu wa yata'addabu. To spend on your children the greatest dollar or ringgit that you can put in your children's life, is to put it as an investment in that which will teach them the Qur'an and that which will teach them fiqh and that which will teach them ethics, al-adab, right? Those are the greatest investments that al-Imam al-Nawawi pushes us towards. He continues and says, also from the obligations that we must be aware of, وَالدَّلِيلُ عَلَى ذَلِكَ وَوُجُوبُ تَعْلِيمِ الْأَوْلَادِ الصِّغَارِ قوله تعالى يا أيها الذين آمنوا قو أنفسكم وأهليكم نارا and the clear evidence from the Quran that it is an obligation upon a father to save his to educate his children about the halal and the haram all these things that we have spoken about is in Surah Al-Tahrim where Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala says O oh you who believe قو أنفسكم وأهليكم نارا save yourself and your family from hellfire it's not enough to save oneself so if a man in his home says, I'm going to pray, but you guys, I told you to pray, you do whatever you want, it is, he has not saved himself. He has destroyed himself. It is not enough to say, I told you, you do it on your own. You now become responsible for their fulfillment up to that age of what? Up to what age? Puberty. Now this is important. And Imam al nawawi he talks about as saghir the young. Because don't get confused and say, oh, well, my dad didn't teach me. Yeah, you're 25 years old. You're supposed to do things on your own. You're a person now. No, it's your parents' responsibility up to that age, where now you become responsible. And therefore, you see in the Quran, Allah shows us this in the tragedies that were experienced by the prophets of Allah. Lut alayhi salam and Nuh alayhi salam their wives, married to prophets, rebelled and were destroyed. Nuh, his son, his son disbelieved in Allah and got off the ship of salvation and drowned in front of him. His own son, his, his blood and tissue. 
You don't say, how could the Prophet of Allah, Nuh, not, you know, his son didn't listen to the Hidayah. No. Because his son reached what age? An age of obligation. Before that age of obligation, Nuh was giving everything he could to teach him about the truth. Once you reach that level where you are now accountable for yourself, and one's family has given you, the father and mother, the wali of your life, has given you everything that you need, you're responsible of yourself. Do not ever look at someone and say, oh, look, their daughter 18, they're not wearing hijab. No, she's her own person. Don't look into yourself and say, oh, look what's happened to my life or my family or my children. No, it's your responsibility from a young age to set the rules and the limits and the tone and the halal and the haram. But once people reach a level where they are oblig ob obliged between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is between them and Allah, right? So therefore there's this clear wording, a sagheer, that is used by Imam al-Nawawi so that there's no confusion in that matter. Ali radiallahu anhu, and this is a wonderful statement if you can make note of it insha'Allah. Ali radiallahu anhu ibn Abi Talib, he says, about this verse, save yourself and your family from Jahannam, Ma'na, the meaning of this ayah as taught to us by the Prophet Alimuhum, teach them in their young age, Ma yanjuna bihi minan nar, that which will save them from Jahannam. Teach them about istighfar, about tawbah, about salah, about sunnah, about halal. Teach them the things that they can use to save themselves from, the, from Jahannam. وَهَذَا هُوَ ظَاهِرُ الْآيَةِ And this is the apparent outer meaning of the ayah. And this is the meaning of the words of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. كُلُّكُمْ رَاعٍ All of you are responsible for that which is in your care, which you have duty of care over. وَكُلُّكُمْ مَسْؤُولٌ عَنْ رَعِيَّتِهِ the second level of knowledge, so that's the first, those are the obligations. Knowing Allah, knowing Salah, knowing the obligations of worship, teaching our children, knowing about the names and attributes of all those kind of things we must know. The second level of knowledge, he says, it is to learn Fardul Kifayah, that which is an obligation upon the community. That if some of the community fulfill it and others don't, then it is accepted from everyone. In our community, you must, in our community, in your community here in Kuala Lumpur, there must be people who are dedicated to memorizing the Quran in its entirety and leading the prayer with it. There must be people who travel abroad to learn the fiqh of this religion. If everyone stays and no one goes, everyone is responsible. Everyone is held accountable. But if some go that meet the equilibrium and meet the requirements of the community, it is accepted from everyone, insha'Allah. So what are these things that he mentions? He goes, إِقَامَتْ دِينَهُمْ مِنَ الْعُلُومِ الشَّرْعِيَةِ To learn that which will obligate upon them their religious studies, كَحِفْظِ الْقُرْآنِ وَالْأَحَدِيثِ وَعُلُومِهِمَا وَالْأُصُولِ وَالْفِقْ وَالنَّحْوَ وَاللُّغَ والتصريف. Learning the language and the, and, and the morphology of the language and so forth. وَمَعْرِفَةِ رِوَاتِ الْحَدِيثِ وَالْإِجْمَاعِ وَالْخِلَافِ And knowing what's, uh, what is agreed upon in the community and where there's disagreements. All of these things come into that second set of obligation. Others, he said, they went to the opinion where they said that it is an obligation upon the community to also meet the worldly needs. If you don't have enough female gynecologists, you need female doctors. If you don't have enough female teachers, you need female teachers. Male teachers, you need male teachers. Engineers to build bridges, you need engineers. It becomes a religious duty, even though it's in a worldly sphere. It's not a religious action. But it becomes necessary for the fulfillment of the aims of everyone in the community. One of the most significant statements that an Imam al Nawawi makes and I forgot to mention it, so I would like to go back to it. So please excuse me on that, insha'Allah. It's from the first step of the sacred knowledge that is obligatory upon all of us. And I forgot to read this paragraph out to you. From the first step of knowledge, he says, Ilmu al-Qalb, the knowledge that relates to the heart. 
spirituality. The knowledge that relates to purifying our heart from haram. It is to know the detriment of the illnesses of envy and arrogance and pride and what is similar to it. Imam al Ghazali and others they said the knowledge of the hudud, of the limitations and the reasons, asbab and the cures. Fardu Ain is an obligation upon everyone. Everyone must know what is hasad. Everyone must know what is envy. And every one of us must seek to learn how to cure it within themselves. Qala ghayru, other than Al-Ghazali said, that if someone feels within themselves that they are prone to jealousy of others, it is sinful for them to remain unknowledgeable of how to remove jealousy. You cannot see within yourself that you have an anger problem. You come home and you're angry. You yell, your voice is loud, your wife says, your neighbors say, your father says, your mother says, why are you so angry? You gotta learn to calm down, you gotta take control of yourself. You, you gotta stop this, this is too much, it's gonna destroy our home. It is fard upon you as Salah is fard, it is fard upon you in equal measure, according to Imam al Nawi and the ulama, that you find the treatment for it. That which will remove anger from your heart, that which would remove jealousy from your heart, that which would remove uh, lying from your tongue, eyes that look at sinful things. You cannot just sit and say, Allah help me, Ya Allah help me. No. You must be active in seeking a cure, whether it's physical or spiritual. Whether physical or spiritual. It could be you go to an anger, anger management session. How to control my anger? You have to. Because those ailments of the heart are the things that destroy the ailments of the body, the outer body. And therefore the Prophet Muhammad said, in the, in the body there is a place that if it is pure, and if it is settled, everything is settled. It's the heart, that spiritual, proverbial heart. So he continues and says, <laughs> If a person is able to cure himself بلا تعلم, without seeking a particular cure, kafa, it's enough. He won't be asked by Allah, why didn't you learn about the hadith and what the measures to take? to stop looking at pornography, or to stop hearing sinful vulgarity, to restrain yourself from anger and mismanagement of the rights of others. If he develops techniques that aren't religious based, it's enough, Allah will free him. But if he doesn't develop secular or worldly ways to control these things, it's lazim, wajib, at-tathir, to purify himself, كَمَا يَلْزَمُهُ تَرْكُ الزِّنَا As much as it is a compulsory upon him to not commit adultery. It becomes so compulsory upon you to not be angry as it would be to say to someone, this is haram. Everyone knows to cheat on one spouse is haram. No one doubts that. But everyone doubts, oh, do I have to, you know, remove anger and jealousy? Yes. With the same gravity. This is how the Imams of Ahlul Sunnah Look at those disastrous moments. And anyone who's acquainted with our Muslim communities knows that there are a lot more homes destroyed because of anger, mismanagement of one's anger, hostility, uh, inadequacies, than of someone cheating or, or these other things that pop up. There are more homes destroyed from the issues that relate to the heart than there are that relate to the issues of the kabair, the major sins. Very few men will divorce their wife because she's a thief. But many may divorce a spouse because she's always talking bad about people. She always makes me feel bad. She can't restrain her tongue. She's always looking to what other people have and telling me I want the same as them. She's always jealous of others. I can't live like this. I feel like I'm drowning. This is, this is the reality of what you find. 
Same with the sisters. He doesn't talk. I don't know how to talk to him. Every time I talk, he yells. Every time I ask, he's angry. The ch children don't want anything to do with How can I, I, I need a divorce, right? Those are the things that destroy homes more than this person has committed this sin, this person has stolen someone's car. No, those are secondary, further away. We'll return now to the third step, the third religious obligation and the third step of sacred knowledge of the ilm of the sharia, ah, which is a nafl. This is completely voluntary. So the first two were obligations. One obligation on us as individuals and the second obligation on us as a community. The third are voluntary. Anyone can do it, man or woman, young or old. And these things are delving into the study of the principles of our faith, the usul and the furu'a, looking into how we can share our faith with others, how we can further and write books, ilm, writing it down, preparing presentations, going to extra classes, learning secondary things past what we already know, studying the seerah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu you know, doing these kind of things that are extra to what is the basic forms of knowledge. But here's what's important. Al-Imam al-Nawawi makes a section where he says that if one has not fulfilled the first obligation, which is personal obligation, then the third obligation is null, unacceptable. If you don't consolidate your knowledge of the essence of what makes you a Muslim, you're wasting your time by looking at these secondary theoretical things or things that relate to uh, things that are not a part directly of your life and your worship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So therefore he confines you and says, no, go back and learn the essence before you go into the secondary issues insha'Allah. He begins the chapter of Adab al-Muta'allim. Uh, Al-Mu'allim, excuse me. We're going to look at the manners of a teacher. And he begins by talking the manners of a teacher because in the next chapter we're going to talk about is the manners of a student. And I want to join these two together because it shows us the ethics of what we seek to be as people who are teachers to others. And you say, Brother Yahya, I'm not going to sit on a stage like you to teach others about Islam. But you forget that you have a son who's sitting in the back seat while you drive your car every day. You have a son who, and a daughter who live in your home who you are their primary teacher. That's your job. For the first five years of your child's life, they will learn more than you in them than the rest of their life, university, PhD, doesn't matter what they do. Those first five years, they absorb from you emotional intelligence. How to react to situations, how to live, how to confront challenges, how to get along and interact and teamwork with others, who to be close friends with, who not to be, how to speak to elders, how to speak to younger people. Sometimes we forget that when we bend over a child and we're speaking down to them and we're angry with them, they're looking up at this giant monster. You know, when you have to see, you know, this little three-year-old, four-year-old, and you're five foot seven, five foot eight, to them, they're under uh, two feet, and they're looking up at you, and you're this overwhelming presence. Allahu Akbar. We forget that we are pri the primary teachers for the youngest people who interact with and depend on us for their very survival. And because they depend on us, they can't voice their concern. So all of a sudden you're yelling, stop crying, and they stop crying. You think, oh good, I got them to work, I stop crying. But it's only because they know they need you for food and drink. And if I don't stop crying, they're not going to help me in life. And what you've done is destroyed any semblance of trust. That that child now understands that when I'm old enough to speak my own word, and I don't need you to feed me, inside their mind, they will not react to you in that same way, okay, I'm going to be quiet. No, they're going to say, I'm out the door. I'm going to live my own life. 
I'm going to do my own thing. فَأَنْتَ مُعَلِّمْ You are a teacher. You are the beginning of scholarship. He says, now from the, man, from the manners of a teacher, Imam al-Shafi'i said, وَدِدْتُ I would love أَنَّ الْخَلْقِ That everyone that I meet, تَعَلَّمُوا هَذَا الْعِلْمِ That they learn it, عَلَىٰ أَنْ لَا يُنْسَبْ إِلَيَّ حَرْفٌ مِنْهِ And that no one would say they learned it from me. I don't want anyone to say, oh, look what he's contributed to Islam. Now, this is the first step of finding a competent teacher. Someone who's not in it to be better than you. A teacher's aim, a good teacher, is that they want to teach you so that you develop tools to become better than them. That's what Imam al-Shafi'i is saying. I want that the students that I'm teaching, the people that I'm living with, the likes of Imam Ahmad, that when I'm talking with them and when I'm teaching with them, I wish that they never say, I learned from a Shafi'i, that they gain to such a degree that now they're teachers on their own and no one says, I learned anything from him. This is, compare that to the words of Imam al Nawawi in our last session of telling us who not to study with. The one who's angry if you go and learn from someone else. He continues and says, Abu Yusuf, now Imam al Nawawi is quoting from Abu Yusuf who is the student of Imam Abu Hanifa. Now, Imam al Nawawi does this intentionally. Our scholars, they tell us that he intentionally narrates from the opposite madhab, which is the madhab of Imam Abu Hanifa, to show you his humility in accepting the truth from whoever. Abu Yusuf said, and he quotes him, Ya qawm, he would say to those who study with him, Aridu bi'ilmakum, seek with the knowledge that you are seeking, seeking Allah. Fa'innani, by Allah, I tell you, I share with you, lam, I never once, ajlis sat, majlisan, qat, in any time, I sat and taught at any time, Except that I made the niyyah, anwi fihi, an atawadah, that I am humbled before those who I'm teaching. And I wish that from those who are teaching will those who will correct me. Those who will say, no, you made a mistake there, and they correct me. What should a, pair, what should a teacher begin to teach first? He says, يعلمهم, he should begin السخاء والجود ومكارم الأخلاق First thing you teach سخاء, generosity الجود, returning others favor when they give you favor ومكارم الأخلاق and the refined etiquettes وطلاقة الوجه and a, and a pleasing disposition happiness, always exude happiness and and a smile upon one's face. Walhilm and forbearance, forgiving others. Wasabr and patience when tested. Wamulazamat al wara and to be scrupulous, not to seek from others things. That someone has something, you don't look to it and you want similar to it. Wal wara, wal khushua, humility before Allah. والسكينة, tranquility, والوقار, humbleness and honor, والتواضع, lowering oneself for others, والخضوع, submissiveness to Allah, واجتناب الضحق, and not to be too loud with one's laughter, والإكثار من المزاح, and to be always joking around, وملازمة الآداب الشرعية, and always to be present with the religious uh, etiquettes that we are taught, الظاهرة, that are seen by others, والخفية, and that are within, within our capacity to fulfill. Now look at all these characteristics. This is, he's saying, the primary goal of a teacher is that the things that your students are gonna see from you are الجود, generosity. الجود, السخاء, giving, giving to others. Makarim al akhlaq refined character, a happy disposition, talaqat al waj, always smiling and content. Al hilm, forgiving those who have harmed you, forbearance, 
الصبر patience when when enduring the harm from others ملازمة الورع to always be scrupulous and not seek what others have al khushu' humility before Allah al sakina to be tranquil in one's personality al waqar to have awe in the eyes of people that people respect you at tawadu' but yet to be submissive to Allah not to laugh too much and not to joke too much and to fulfill all of those obligations in in public and also in private with one students and he continues to say and to be from those who are cleaning and helping to clean الوساخة. you see something disorganized fix it you see paper on the ground pick it up الملابس وإزالة الروائح to always have a good scent and to clean and to cut and to trim one's hair and, and to have a, a, a pleasing appearance وتسريح اللحية and to fulfill uh, and to, to always have a, a, a pleasant uh, appearance so all of those become obli- uh, the first things that Imam al-Nawawi says should be apparent from one who is teaching others he continues to say at the same time, what fi nafs al hal al khushu' bayn yadi Allah to show humility before Allah, for Allah says, "Fala tu zakku anfusakum." Don't ever think of yourselves better than others. It is only Allah who knows who has true taqwa. Inna akramakum inda Allah atqakum, and the best of you is only the one who has taqwa before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also the Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّ أَحَدَكُمْ يَعْمَلُ بِعَمَلِ أَهْلِ الْجَنَّةِ Which is that famous hadith that a person will live a life that they're just an arm length from Jannah, but perhaps before their time they will do a sin that lead them away into Jahannam. So he says, even though you seek to have all these characteristics in you and show it to others, always remember that it is Allah who knows who is truly pious between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He continues to say, Do not humiliate knowledge. What does that mean? It means don't give it to those who don't deserve it. Now the scholars were very, very strict with this. Some people, they don't deserve to learn it. And there's at times, you know, for myself and others, sometimes you will have a student whose parents are forcing them to Qur'an class or or they're not interested. It is better for you to honor those who came interested by kicking out the one who isn't interested to honor ilm. Because knowledge should not be forced upon anyone. And the imams, they would expel from their circles those who were not worthy of receiving it. So a man comes and asks Al Imam Malik, How is Allah? Allah is on, on the, how, what does it mean, Al Rahman Al Arshistawa? Al Imam Malik put his head down. Uh, the Rahman is, rose above, the, above his throne in the heavens. What does this mean? Imam Malik put his head down, and when he put his face up, he looked angry. And he said, Al Istiwa Umaloom, Allah has informed us of this. الكيف مجهول how nobody knows it السؤال عنه بدعة to question and to delve into these matters is heresy بدعة get out of my masjid you're not permitted here I'm not going to receive your questions anymore you're not even going to sit and listen to what I have to say right so you have to honor knowledge you have to preserve it for those who seek it also he says ومنها أنه إذا فعل فعلا صحيحا جائزا في نفس الأمر وفي نفس الأمر ولكن ظاهره أنه حرام أو مكروه أو مخل بالمروءة ونحو ذلك فينبغي له أن يخبر أصحابه به He says from the etiquette of a value teacher is that if he's doing something permitted it's halal it's something halal but someone from a distance seeing him might think it's haram or even makruh. 
not even, it doesn't have to be haram, or even makruh, disliked, it becomes obligatory upon him to say and to clarify the matter. Uh, for example, many of you know, you know me and my wife and my kids. If you see me all of a sudden walking in KL, holding hands with someone that isn't my wife, it's my sister, right? Could be my sister, Amina, she came from Canada, she's visiting, and she comes and she hugs me from the I say, whoa, what's happening, brother Yahya? What's going on? That's not his wife. I know what his wife looks like. That's not her. And I see you and I see that there is some confusion that is set in you. I cannot just say, who are they to judge me? I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm, it's halal. It's my sister. Who are they to look at me and, and think? Any, no, I'm not going to explain myself to anyone. No, you're wrong. In our deen, you have to. The look of impropriety is sinful. Even if it is not impropriety. Even if it is not haram. If you, and this happened to me in Perth, by the way. I pulled up, brother, you know, uh, sister sitting next to me. Everyone knows what my wife looks like. You know, we've lived in Perth for so long. Brother pulls up at a red light. He said, oh my brother, yeah. And then he, he sees this lady sitting there. You know, it's, it's not my wife. He looked. I said, okay, it's my sister. He goes, oh, oh okay, brother. <laughs> right? It's only natural. This is what the Prophet ﷺ did. Safiya visited him in the masjid in the hadith in Sahih Muslim. And late at night, he walked her home. As he's walking with her home, two men from the Ansar from a distance, far away, they see the Prophet, they know the Prophet ﷺ, but they see a figure of a woman, you know, shorter, dressed in women's clothes. They don't know who it is in the night. They don't know who it is. فَأَسْرَعَ They saw, they looked at the Prophet and they began to walk away quickly. And the Prophet said, عَلَىٰ رِسْلِكُمَا Stop! Come here! Come! Come here. You have to see who it is. This is Safiya, the wife of your Prophet Muhammad. They said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, we never think something bad of you. You're Muhammad. He said, Maybe now you don't, but shaitan circulates through a human being the way blood does. Maybe it's not in your heart now, the thought is somewhere else, but maybe it'll circulate and come to your heart. Maybe it'll be a thing, oh yeah, yeah, I saw brother Yahya, yeah, he had this, uh, yeah, he was holding hands, what? He was driving and there was, yeah, someone with him, who? All of a sudden, on Facebook and Twitter, <laughs> right? UFO sightings. That's it, that's how gossip begins, right? Islam seeks to prevent it. So even if it is not a haram thing, even if it is makruh and there's some doubt and you feel others saw it and it's not clear, you, ha you have to go to them and clear it up. He then continues and says, the knowledge that one imparts and the one who sits to learn from you should be protected by you. And he says that a good teacher is the one who seeks to protect his students from misunderstanding or wants to answer the questions and to show them that, you know, he wants to clarify the issues. And he reports the statement of Abdullah ibn Abbas, who is the cousin of the Prophet Muhammad sallam, and the most knowledgeable of the Quran of the Prophet sallam, where he said, Akramun nasi alayhi, the people I love and honor the most, Jalisi, is the one who sits to learn from me who comes to study from me. لو استطعت والله if I was able ألا يقع الذباب على وجهه لفعل If I could protect my student from a fly landing on their face, I would do it for them. I wished for them the best in everything that I have. This is how the umana and the scholars of faith thought to teach those who study with them. And therefore Allah says to the Prophet وَخْفِ جَنَاحَكَ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ Lower your wing of humility to those who are believers. Be merciful with those who love one another for the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also he says, Al-Fudayl ibn Iyad said, Inna Allah azza wa jal yuhibbu al-alim al-mutawadi' wa yabghadu al-alim al-jabbar. Allah loves the scholar who is humble 
And Allah hates the scholar who thinks highly of themselves. وَمَنْ تَوَاضَعَ لِلَّهِ تَعَالَى وَرِثَهُ الْحِكْمَةِ And the one who humbles himself to Allah, Allah grants them wisdom that they would not attain without that humbleness. So those are just a few words of Imam al-Nawawi as they relate to this, the, 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 the qualities of a good teacher and what they seek to teach with. We're going to end, insha'Allah, with adab al-muta'allim, some of the knowledge and some of the qualities of a good student. And alhamdulillah, all of us are students. You and I, we seek to learn more about our faith. And the Prophet ﷺ begins this by telling us, as we mentioned, the importance of the heart. And we began our journey this morning with talking about sidq, truthfulness and ikhlas, sincerity to Allah, which both take root in the heart. And when the heart is pure, the rest of the actions of the body are accepted, as is in the hadith of the Messenger Muhammad ﷺ. يستحب للطالب أن يكون It is beneficial for the student to free of his time for his study لألا يقطع الانشغال So that he is not uh, distracted from his study due to necessities and other things Meaning that when you come to study something just say you're with us here today. And I know you have children and so forth. Don't just put him with someone who you think can manage. No, put him with someone who you know you don't have to keep checking on. And that your heart will be distracted half the day wondering. I wonder what if, oh my God, what if they got into the balcony? Oh, no, you have to set yourself that when you're going to study and you're going to dedicate time for it, that you make it to the best of your ability. Also, he uses the statement of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where he speaks about ilm and Safwan came to visit him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he came from a distance and the Prophet was laying down in his masjid and he was laying down on a, on a reddish, uh, you know, brownish kind of garment ala burdin, a burd is like this, a cloak, ahmar that was reddish, ruddy in color, brownish in color. And as Safwan came, Safwan said, Inni jittu atlub al ilm. I've come to learn, Ya Rasulullah. And the Prophet ﷺ sat up, wasawa fiyaba, and prepared his garment and said, Marhaban, greetings to the one who has come to learn. Which emphasizes the point that the student comes to knowledge and knowledge doesn't come to the student. And the Imams, they would refuse to go to teach. And they would say, if you want to learn, you come to learn, right? The Imams, Imam Malik, Imam Ahmad, the Muluk and these uh, Khulafa, they would say, come to the palace and teach. They would say, no, I'm in that masjid. Oh, but the ground is not clean. And the, No, if you want to learn, you want your children to learn, you come. فَالْعِلْمُ يُؤْتَى وَلَا يأتي. Knowledge is come, you come to it, it does not come to you, right? That was the statement of the great Imams in that regard. Also, we hear the statement of Yahya ibn Abi Kathir, which is found in Sahih Muslim. لا يستطاع العلم براحة الجسم Knowledge cannot be acquired with comfort. You guys are sitting, I know you're back, you're like, oh man, oh, it's been an uncomfortable long five, six hours. And you want to stretch and you want to take a walk. And yes, sometimes it gets a little bit, uh, you know, distracting and this and that. But without, with comfort of body, you will never learn. You have to give something from your wealth, from your time, from your effort, from your body, from your comfort. That will, that will give you in return that which will be blessed in knowledge. And this was the way of the Sahaba, Ridwanullahi alayhim. They would come from distances to ask the Prophet Muhammad questions and they would come to seek it directly from him and from the most knowledgeable that they could share with. Of the most uh, important statements as well that relate to acquiring knowledge for us as students is 
dua and asking Allah to make our knowledge beneficial. So you find the Prophet ﷺ would say, Allahumma rzuqna ilman nafi'a. Oh Allah, bless us with knowledge that is beneficial, meaning one that I can put into practice, one that I can use in my life. Let me learn from this Quran something that I can implement. Abdullah ibn Umar as is reported in the Sahih, he says we used to learn 10 verses, then 10 verses. 10 and then we would see how we would apply them, how we would use them in our life, and then we take on 10 more verses. How we can apply them, how we can use them into our life. And that was the habit of the Messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You find also many of them, many of the tabi'een and the tabi' tabi'een would make dua for their teachers. Where they would say, Allahumma astur aiba mu'allimi. Oh Allah, don't let me see anything bad from my teacher. Because in part of knowledge, you want that the person you're learning from, that Allah blesses them. What good is learning from someone and in your heart you say, oh, I wonder if they're a good person or not. You ask Allah, oh Allah, cover, the, cover their shame. All of us are shameful. All of us between us and Allah, all of us. Even the, the greatest of the great have their zalla, have their mistakes, have their moments. And you say, oh Allah, cover the shame of my teacher. Even if it's there, oh Allah, hide it. If it's there, oh Allah, forgive it, right? Make dua for those who teach you and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give them thabat and strength and protect them. Uh, institutions such as uh, Jakim and the ulama you have in this country and those who authorize the halal from what is haram and those who work to give you clarity. Why do people uh, you know, love to visit Malaysia? There's many reasons. But because you know, alhamdulillah, you come to a place, you know, if it doesn't say no halal, it's opposite, right? Everywhere else you look, is it halal? Show me a halal sticker. Here it's the opposite, you know? You go to most restaurants, if it's pork and they have things, it says no halal, we're not halal. The other ones are halal. You have that clarity and that confidence. Someone did it. Someone that you forget to make dua for. Someone who at times when they make a mistake, you hold them accountable too much. And I want to end with this quote of Al-Imam Ibn Asakir. And Al-Imam Ibn Asakir was one of the great scholars of hadith. And he was one of the profound imams. Where he said, اعلم يا أخي وفقني الله وإياك لمرضاته My dear brother, my dear sister, may Allah let you and I be pleasing to Allah. This is his dua in beginning. Learn, no, my dear brother, may Allah bless you and I to please Allah. وَجَعَلَنَا مِنْ مَنْ يَخْشَاهُ وَيَتَّقِيهِ حَقَّ تُقَاتِهِ And may Allah make us from those who fear Him and who are pious to Him as He deserves. أَنَّ لُحُومَ الْعُلَمَاءِ مَسْمُومَ That the bodies of the scholars are poisoned pieces of meat. You know, when someone backbites you, they're eating your flesh. But when you backbite the scholar, it's poisoned. It's not just eating flesh, it's poisoned flesh. وَعَادَةُ اللَّهِ And Allah has set the precedent. فِي هَتْكِ أَسْطَارِ مُنْتَقِسِيهِمْ مَعْلُومًا And Allah has shown the precedent of those who seek to rip down the scholars, what he does to those people. مَنْ أَطْلَقَ لِسَانَهُ فِي الْعُلَمَاءِ بِالثَّلْبِ Those who attack the scholars with their tongues, unjustifiedly, without evidence, without reason, just with hearsay and backbiting, and dhan, I think, not I know, but I think, or it could be. بَلَاهُ اللَّهُ That that type of person, Allah will trial them, give them the bala قَبْلَ مَوْتِهِ Before their death, بِمَوْتِ الْقَلْبِ Before they die, their heart will have died. The iman in their heart will lessen. No one who is critical of the ulama without reason, or who blows a small reason into a big reason, except that that person has missing iman in their heart. 
Because those who guard Islam are the inheritors of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. You have to understand this. Not because someone is a alim, it means they're better than you between you and Allah. But the likelihood that insha'Allah they have taqwa and knowledge that makes them better than just someone who is a worshipper is likely. And we always think of our ulama as what is best. And you always make dua for the ulama and those who teach people good. That those the ants and the fish make dua for, how could we humble people who learn from them, not ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us through them, through the knowledge that they give us. So a way to preserve our heart and our iman is to guard what we say about others. You always hear these offhand comments. Ah, oh, no, 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 he doesn't know. Allahu Akbar. No, 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 uh, you know, he does bid'ah. What? Just like that, bid'ah. Oh, no, no, he's uh, uh, this, he's that. Offhand comments that we think are just simple things. When in fact, a statement, just one word, لا يلقي لها بالا, that a person doesn't pay attention to its significance, will pull people down into the depth of Jahannam, as is mentioned by the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa May Allah honor the scholars of this land and this nation and this country. Allahumma ameen. May Allah protect the institutions that protect the faith of those who believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this blessed country. Allahumma ameen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unite us upon the haqq, upon the truth. And may Allah cover the faults of our imams and our ulama. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cure them of their ailments and their sins and make us and them better for it bi idnillahi ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put the love of the Qur'an in our hearts and the love of the sunnah and the tradition and fiqh into the, law, into the hearts of us and our children. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to practice what we speak and to make our hidden better than our public. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to adjust our families before others. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put the love that we have with one another as reason for us to enter Jannatul Firdaus with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik ashadu an la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruk wa atubu ilayk. It's now six o'clock and this was the advertised time that we were going to uh, end. Uh, if anyone wants to remain behind for questions, I will make myself available for 15 minutes or as, as people need insha'Allah. And for, for those who would like to leave on time, you are more than welcome and with honor to depart insha'Allah. So if there's any questions, you can send them forward or ask them. If they're not, then we will all depart early bi-ibnillahi ta'ala and I can see you tomorrow at my talk or future engagements insha'Allah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.